Hello everyone. Welcome to week two of our webinar series. So my name is Amber McCollum and I will be in your instructor today along with our colleague, my colleague Cindy Schmidt. Just as a, a review, uh, for this course we have two sessions per week, each Wednesday, each, sorry, each Thursday. Session A will be at 1 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time in the U.S. And session B will be at 10 to 11.30 p.m. Eastern Time in the U.S. Please make sure that you only sign up for and attend one of these session times. We have created two sessions to reach out to a broader international audience. Um, these sessions will be at the same time each week. We will have lectures with many guest speakers who are experts in the field. And if there's time, uh, at the end we will have Q&A session as well. We have two homework assignments after this week and after week four. Uh, these will be submitted through Google Forms. The homework link for this week is now available on the RSET website and has been added to the chat box. To receive credit for the homework, you must submit all answers via the Google Forms by uh, Thursday, June 30th, which is the deadline for this homework. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend four out of five live webinars and complete all homework assignments. It takes some time to process these certificates, um, so you can expect to receive them two to three months after the completion of our course from Marinette Martins. There's one prerequisite for this course. You should know and understand the fundamentals of remote sensing. You can watch our on-demand course that's listed here which includes two one-hour recorded webinars that you can watch on your own time. As mentioned previously, you can access all the course materials on the RSET website here. Each week you'll be able to find a PDF of the presentation, a link to view the recording of each webinar, and a link to any of the homework assignments. Please note that in order to view the recordings, Online, you must register your information. This helps us keep track of who's, who is viewing the recordings. Once you register, you will automatically be taken to view the recording online. Here's an overview of the course agenda. This week, we will be discussing sensors and products for terrestrial systems and generation of activity data. This week, we will first give you a bit more uh, background about the RCEP program. We will discuss activity data and how it's derived. We will introduce remote sensing data sources that are often used for carbon monitoring. We will discuss pre-processing image requirements to ensure data quality. We will provide a general techniques for image classification and change detection. We'll provide considerations for National Forest Monitoring System sustainability and guide you through NASA's Carbon Map Mapper beta website. If there's time, we will also have um, time for questions and answers at the end. Since we did not provide an overview of the RCEP program during week one, we wanted to briefly discuss the program here. The Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, or RSET, is part of NASA's Applied Sciences Program. Our goal is to increase the utility of NASA Earth Science data for applied resource management professionals, policymaker, and re regulatory agencies. We conduct online and in-person trainings in a variety of application areas. Our webinars consist of multi-week sessions about a specific topic that can be a combination of lectures, live demos or tools, and tutorials. RSET operates with a gradual learning approach, where we often conduct the basic introductory webinars, followed by more in-depth in advanced webinars or in-person trainings. Our in-person trainings are generally more in-depth with a fewer number of participants. They include case studies and participant projects that are relevant to the focused audience. These trainings require collaboration with another organization that can provide the meeting and lab space. We're also working to increase our train the trainer activities, where we train specific targeted individuals to conduct their own remote sensing trainings. 
RSET conducts trainings in the focus areas of air quality, water resources, land management, wildfires, and disasters. The RSET team is located at multiple NASA centers and consists of scientists with backgrounds specific to the topic area that they teach. We have varied levels of training that can range from basic introductions to advanced, where participants are downloading and processing data to meet their needs. RSET has completed over 60 trainings since it began in 2009 and has reached thousands of participants globally. This figure on the right shows the geographic distribution of participating organizations in the US and globally. Our online trainings are in high demand with our international audience, especially in regions where there's little in-situ data or resources available. RSET is a resource for connecting applied tools and remote sensing to end users for enhanced decision making. OK, so jumping back into the materials for today, what are activity data, and why are they useful for carbon monitoring?
Hi, everyone. So I'm going to start discussing some pre-processing data requirements, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, image uh, classification and change detection. So many types of satellite data need to be pre-processed before they can be used for land cover mapping or detecting change. Pre-processing is necessary because it allows satellite observations over different time periods to be compared to the, each other, and that's the only way that you can do change detection. I will be discussing two main types of pre-processing steps, geometric correction, which corrects for angle of view of the satellite sensor and for high relief terrain, and radiometric correction, which corrects for di different atmospheric conditions between images from two different time periods. Geometric correction is very important for detecting change over time using imagery from different dates. Firstly, images need to be aligned or co-registered with each other. If they are not aligned with each other, then areas of land use change will be overestimated because the change detection analysis will detect change where none has occurred. Secondly, image distortion due to the scanner, platform, or the terrain must be corrected using an orthorectification process. These types of distortions are more apparent in aerial photos than in satellite imagery, primarily because the satellite is a more stable platform. Orthorectification requires the use of a digital elevation model with specialized processing software. Most satellite imagery has already been geometrically corrected and projected to a geographic reference system, but it's always good to check. The pixel values of an image are dependent on the viewing geometry of the satellite, the location of the sun, and specific weather and atmospheric conditions. To be able to compare images from the same region, but different time periods, the images need to be corrected for these different conditions. There are many methods of doing this, but essentially every method converts raw pixel values to surface reflectance. Surface reflectance approximates what would be measured by a sensor held just above the Earth's surface without any artifacts from the atmosphere or illumination and viewing geometry. The series of images on the bottom show portions of a Landsat image displaying the natural color of a level one product in A, a top of atmosphere correction in B, and the same image where the pixel values have been converted to surface reflectance in C. You can currently acquire Landsat surface reflectance products for Landsats four, five, and eight. These products are generated using the Landsat Ecosystem Disturbance Adaptive Processing System, or LEADAPS, which was developed by scientists at NASA Goddard as part of the Measures product, Project. The USGS now maintains the system and provides these products via their Earth Explorer data portal listed here. There are several caveats for the Landsat surface reflectance products that you need to be aware of. They are provisional, meaning that the algorithms are still being validated. Landsat 7 is not gap-filled, meaning that there will still be missing data in the images. They are less useful in arid or snow-covered regions at low sun angles in coastal regions or in scenes with extensive clouds. The panchromatic band at 15 meters is not included, and they have specific date ranges, which you can check on the Earth Explorer website. Next, we will discuss image classification and change detection. Image classification is the process for turning pixel data into information. For carbon monitoring, it's, it's primarily used for mapping forest versus non-forested areas, mapping land cover, or stratifying forest types. There are many different ways to do image classification, but I will be discussing three of them, visual interpretation, pixel-based, and object-based. It's important to understand that image classification needs ground or other ancillary information to improve or verify results. Also, image classification requires specialized software such as NV, QGIS, or ArcGIS, and specialized training. 
The example on the bottom shows a part of a Landsat image of Lake Tahoe in California on the left and a land cover map created from that image on the right. As I just mentioned, the process of image classification turns pixel values into information that's useful for carbon monitoring. In order to do this, you must determine a classification system to use. It can be as simple as determining forest from non-forested areas to much more detailed systems. A good example is the IPCC Good Practice Guide for Land Use and Land Use Change and Forestry, which specifies top-level categories such as forest land, cropland, grasslands, wetlands, human settlements, and other land. Determining which classif classification system to use will depend on the program needs and the characteristics of the region. As part of the UN RED program, this land cover map of Panama on the bottom was released on April 2014. The map is intended to inform decision makers about the current status of forest resources and will serve as the baseline for monitoring deforestation and forest degradation. The map includes 32 classes for forest cover and land use such as forests, forest plantations, specific agricultural crops, and cultural uses. To be useful in estimating emissions and removals associated with RED plus activities, remote sensing data should be classified in the categories specified in this table. These classes can be typically derived from moderate resolution imagery from Landsat and the Sentinel instruments. The forest non-forest class is typically used for basic trend analysis and, and can be used as the basis for other products. This type of map shows the extent of all forest types within a country. The minimum mapping unit or smallest area to be mapped for all maps should be less than half a hectare. The temporal frequ frequency that the map should be updated is annually. The forest stratification map, as I mentioned previously, identifies forest types with common biomass densities. This ultimately provides more accurate carbon estimates. The suggested primary stratification is primary forest, modified natural forest, and planted forest. The all land use categories map can be used for national baseline mapping. Countries can decide what level of detail they prefer, but should consider using the UN FAO land cover classification system. This table shows a summary of the types of remote sensing used for different map products. Coarse resolution data, such as MODIS, are only used operationally for forest stratification. Medium and high resolution data are used operationally for all map products. L-band radar is provisionally used for forest, non-forest mapping, and are pre-operational for the other two map products. C-band radar is still in the research and development stage, x band radar is not currently used, and LIDAR is occasionally used. There are many different ways to classify imagery, but almost all can be categorized into two approaches, pixel-based and object-based. In, in the pixel-based approaches, each pixel is grouped into a spectrally similar class. These approaches are most useful where there are multiple changes in land use within a short period of time, and they are best suited when there is wall-to-wall -wall data coverage and time series consistency at the pixel level is required. Object-based approaches partitions an image into groups of pixels that are spectrally similar and spatially adjacent. Boundaries of pixel groups delineate ground objects in much the same way a human analyst would do based on its shape, tone, and texture. This process is called segmentation. These, these kinds of images can be easier for an analyst to interpret. This approach is also used on radar imagery to reduce speckle. It's especially useful for high spatial resolution imagery because pixel-based approaches tend to be very noisy. The images below show the visual differences between the two approaches. On the left here, it's a little arrow, it's the pixel-based approach, and on the right 
over here, you can see the same image that has been segmented. So this is the segmented image right here. Um, and then that segmented image has been classified here on the far right. So as you can see, when you compare the pixel-based approach here with the segmented approach here, that segmented approach has a much, is a much smoother image. Two different methods are typically used to create land cover maps. The supervised method can, e can use either a pixel-based approach or an object-based approach. The unsupervised method uses a pixel-based approach. cover types that are called training areas. These areas are then used to define the statistical parameters of classification algorithms. The algorithm then automatically identifies and labels all pixels or segments that are stati statistically similar to the training data. In the unsupervised method, a classification algorith algorithm assigns each pixel into one of a number of user-specified classes. Then interpreters assign each of the pixel groupings a value corresponding to a land cover class. I'm going to describe to you a little more about the supervised approach. A supervised classification method, method requires the analyst to select training areas where they know what's on the ground. Then they digitize a polygon within that area, or if the image, image has been segmented, then the analyst identifies segments associated with known land cover types. These known land cover types can be identified through fieldwork or through the visual interpretation of aerial photos or high resolution imagery. Each known area has its own statistical characteristics or spectral signature. The image here shows three simplified land cover types. So we have conifers in the green, water in the blue, and deciduous vegetation in the yellow. And these circles represent um, training areas. And each of those training areas have their own um, statistical characteristics. The spectral signatures from the training areas are then used to categorize each pixel or each segment in the image, resulting in the entire image being classified. So that's specified here. Each of these spectral signatures are then applied to the entire image, so every pixel in this image right here is assigned one of these three categories depending on its own spectral signature. Change detection is one of the most important analyses for monitoring carbon stocks. Many activities that cause degradation of carbon stocks are detectable by satellite imagery such as tree harvesting and wildfire. It's recommended that moderate resolution imagery such as Landsat be used for detecting forest cover changes every 5 to 10 years, although the availability of the entire Landsat archive and new automated techniques are enabling annual change detection. In general, at least two dates of images are necessary to map change. There are many different methods to detect change, including visual interpretation, multi-date image segmentation, digital classification techniques, and pixel trajectory techniques. I will be describing two of these techniques, visual interpretation and multi-date image segmentation. Visual interpretation involves the delineation of change on a computer screen as opposed to delineating on a paper map. This allows production of results that are automatically in digital form. 
This method works best if image analysis tools and experiences are limited. The images on the right show how deforestation in Peru between July 2013 and February 2015 was delineated. Using GIS software to do the delineation enables easier quantification of that change. In the multi-date segmentation approach, objects are defined from the whole set of spectral bands using all sequential images together. So you put all the images from each of the dates all together into one file. It, it relies on spatial, spectral, and temporal information to delineate objects. Segmentation for delineating image objects reduces the processing time of image analysis. The delineation provided by this approach is not only more rapid and automatic, but also finer than what could be achieved using a manual approach. It's repeatable and therefore more objective than a visual delineation by an analyst. Using multi-date segmentations rather than a pair of individual segmentations results in changed areas delineated as separate segments. A typical multi-date segmentation process includes first conducting image segmentation on image pairs, second, selecting training areas, third, conducting a supervised clustering of individual images, and lastly, doing a visual verification of the final product and potential editing. This slide presents an illustration of an implementation of multi-temporal segmentation. Note that in this approach, areas where land cover has changed over the observation period will form separate segments. So you have two separate images here from two different dates. You put them together and you end up with one segmentation file right here. So this has all the changes in, um, delineated as a separate segment. And then from there, you figure out where the changes have occurred and give them labels. So that's the first part of this whole change detection process. The second part is after the segmentation is complete, it is recommended that two supervised object classifications be applied separately on the two multi-date images instead of applying them together because two separate land classifications are much easier to produce in a supervised step than a direct classification of changed traje trajectories. A standard training data set for supervised classification, including samples of all the desired classes, can be created using an, an exhaustive sample of training from the remote sensing data that is used in the analysis. Although unsupervised clustering is also possible, for large areas that use more than a few satellite images, it is recommended that supervised object classification be applied. An unsupervised direct classification of change tra tra trajectories of the two multi-date images together means that a second step of visual labeling of the classification results um, has to be done, um, which is a really time-consuming task. So if you do the supervised approach, you don't have to take that extra step. The multi-date segmentation followed by supervised classification of individual dates is considered more efficient in the case of a large number of images. The example on the bottom shows segments created from two images from 2000 and 2010. B shows the classification that is done on just the two image based on the supervised signatures from the segmented image. This slide presents the basic idea of deriving forest cover change utilizing the classification approach presented in the previous slides. Utilizing the multi-temporal segments, each epic image, in this case 2001 and 2005, is separately classified. The final classifications are then overlaid and a change matrix is created. It's important to highlight 
that due to the multi-temporal classification, the segment borders match perfectly in the two images and that the change areas are outlined as separate segments. In creating a national forest monitoring system, items regarding the sustainability of remote sensing platforms and products need to be considered. First of all, it's important to understand the longevity of the satellite mission providing the data that is underlying activity data generation. For example, after the scanline corrector for Landsat 7 sensor failed, it was important to understand when Landsat 8 would be launched. And now it's important to understand if and when Landsat 9 will be launched. Right now, it's scheduled to launch in 2023. But what happens if Landsat 8 fails? What would be the backup to acquiring your activity data? So these are all considerations you have to think about when you're putting together a national forest monitoring system. It's also important to make sure that consistent processing methods are used to produce activity data. Lastly, to provide transparency and ability to track processing steps, it's very important to archive all imagery and derived products as well as document the steps taken to produce those products. Lastly, I'm going to give you a quick overview of NASA's Carbon Mapper. Carbon Mapper is a prototype data portal and analysis tool developed for NASA's carbon monitoring system. This beta version provides a common platform for visualizing information contained in several representative carbon monitoring system data sets. Unlike other existing sy systems, Carbon Mapper provides a single user interface that combines mapping and data analytics, including regional summaries, sectoral charts, and time series plots for carbon flux and stock data. Before I get started, I want to repeat that this is not an operational data portal. It is still a prototype. The data presented in this portal are preliminary and represent varying degrees of maturity and validation. Also, uncertainty estimates are still being integrated into Carbon Mapper. The current uncertainty estimates are intended to provide representative examples. There are some release notes that you need to read before you use Carbon Mapper located on the website listed here. So when you open Carbon, Carbon Mapper, this is the first image that you see. It's the Global Forest Carbon Stocks data for 2005. The Carbon Mapper is broken into three view types, Map, Bar Chart, and Time Series, and we'll go through a few of those. We will start by going over the Map view. On the top left is a Zoom button, and you can pan the map by dragging with your mouse. The top right shows you the date of the data set you are currently visualizing. Note that not all data sets are available for all dates or all temporal resolutions. If you click on Annual, you will get a drop-down menu to choose specific months. If you click on the year, you will get a drop-down menu that show different years. For now, we're going to keep it at Annual 2005. The Active Datasets box shows which layers you are viewing. In this case, you are looking at the coastlines, borders, and roads overlay, the land water map as a base map, and the above ground biomass global forest carbon stocks data. You can drag to reorder the, the data layers. To get more information about each data set, you can click on the triangle to the left of the name. The top slider adjusts, which is located here, the top slider here adjusts the data set's opacity. You can hover over the color bar, which is here, to see the value range associated with each color. You can also use the slider beneath the color bar to mask out certain color ranges on the map, which is right 
here. If you click on the I, so this I right there, for the data set, you will get more information about that data set. It will tell you which version you are viewing. So this is the information up here. The, P, the principal investigator, a URL for the data set, and a summary of the data. So next, we're going to click on this icon that's circled in red right here, which is the data set selection panel. The data set selection panel is where you add or remove data sets from the current view. To turn on a data set, just click on its title. Data sets are grouped according to their types and species. For more information on either, click on the I, which is located here. So for example, when you select Flux, this is the list of currently available data sets. It also lists the years available for each data set, as you can see here. Next, we'll open the Tools panel, which, can say, which contains widgets for interacting um, with each view. So here's the Tools icon right here, circled in red. This is what you see when you click on the tool icon. The data scaling at the top is used to convert the data displayed in any of the tables or charts to a different mass or compound equivalent. So that's right here. The data examination widget lets you switch between two ways to explore data values on the map. With point data selected, you can click on a pixel on the map to retrieve pixel, county, state, and country values. And then you can use the box histogram here to create a quick look histogram of data over a region. So now we're going to go from the map view to the bar chart view down here. So when you click on that, you see a bar chart for global carbon totals for 2005 for the world. So that's what this bar chart is right here. One of the things you can do is compare subregions. So we're going to click on compare subregions right here. The result is a chart that shows global carbon for 2005 by country. You can see on the left, you can sort or display the data in various ways. So right here, you can see you can sort by name, by total, or display by value, etc. Over here, you can hover over a data point to display a pop-up with relevant values. You can see the example for India here. This icon, circled in red, will open the Data Discovery panel. So we'll do that now. The Data Discovery panel consists of pre-configured questions that can be answered using Carbon Mapper. So you see a whole list of questions here that are all pre-configured. So now we'll go back to the map view and explore some of the data discovery questions. So we're back at map view, and we're going to explore the question that's right here. How do methane and carbon dioxide emissions from fires compare using the IPCC Assessment Report 5 Global Warming Potential Scales in the North American Boreal Region? This example uses two very different remote sensing data sets for the time period 2010 and 2011. This chart compares the methane emissions over North America derived from Japan's Greenhouse Gases Observing Satellite, or GOSAT, with monthly biomass burning flux from NASA's Moppet instrument. 
So the methane fluxes are in the blue and the fire fluxes are in the green here. You can see the large difference between the fluxes in summer 2010, which is here, compared to summer 2011, which is here. So now we're going to switch back to the map view. In this view, you can see the difference in spatial resolution of the two data sets. The methane flux data from GOSAT have up to 50 kilometers spatial resolution, while the fire flux data from Moppet have a much coarser spatial resolution of 400 by 500 square kilometers. You can see the spatial overlap of the CO2 and methane fire fluxes in Canada. And that's all right in this area right here. To get more information about these data sets, you can click on the I right here. And then the information shows up on this side over here, North American Methane Flux. So I'm going to show you one more example in Carbon Mapper. So we're going to go back to the beginning and start with our original Global Carbon 2005 data set and choose the data set selection icon to open up the data sets. So first we're going to open the list of flux data sets. It's listed right here. And then we're going to choose the global fossil fuel CO2 flux data set right here. So when you select that, now you're going to see a list of data available in this particular category. FFDAS stands for Fossil Fuel Data Assimilation System. FFDAS is developed at Purdue University and is a data product that estimates CO2 emissions from the com com combustion of fossil fuels for the years 1997 to 2011. So now we're going to click on FFDAS totals. So when you do that, the map of FFDAS totals for North America appears on the right. So we're going to zoom out to look at other parts of the globe. So note the comparisons between the countries as well as differences within the countries. So the darker it is, of course, the more CO2 flux there is. And in the U.S., you can see, kind of compare the east, the Midwest to the east portion of, or not the Midwest, the eastern portion of the United States versus the west and the central portion of the United States, a big difference. But let's look at this in numbers. But first, we're going to change the year to 2007 because that's what's available for these data. So in the upper right up here, we're going to select 2007. And now we're going to look at the data in a bar chart, which is located down here. So we'll select bar chart. And we're also going to select the view tools icon. So when we do all that, this is what we get. Of course, we get the totals for the globe, so we want to compare countries to each other. So to do that, you have to select compare subregions. So when you do that, you can see all the different um, fluxes, CO2 fluxes coming up for each country for the year 2007. So as you can see, number one and number two, number one is China, number two is the U.S., clearly are the front rudders here. So this concludes the demonstration of Carbon Mapper 
please feel free to explore the tool on your own. There's some great help tools located on the website, but please also remember that it's still a beta, beta version um, and there really is limited data um, available. So keep an eye on it um, into the future because I think it's a really great tool to use. So at this point, um, we're finished for our webinar for this week, so we have a few minutes. We have actually a lot of time for questions. Um, and please feel free to email us with any follow-up questions you might have. Um, here are our contact emails, um, mine, Amber's, and then we, Jenny Hewson from Silva Carbon. Um, and then if you have any general RSAC questions, you can contact Ana Prados. Um, at the email address listed there. And again, our RSET website is there where you can get all the materials for this webinar as well as all the other webinars that we offer. So at this point, I think we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. And I'm going to see if Jenny Hewson is online to help us answer any questions. If we can't answer your questions, um, I think what we'll do is document the questions, and then post something um, on our website a little bit later. So there's some questions about downloading Carbon Mapper data. Um, if, if you go to the Carbon Mapper website, the data are not downloadable directly. But you can, if you go select the I, it will give you a link where you can get the data. A lot of the data for Carbon for that program will be available at the Oak Ridge um, National Lab. Um, DAC, which is the Distributed Active Archive Center uh, for NASA. So it distributes a lot of data. And actually, what I should have done is posted, um, we can post the link to the uh, Oak Ridge National Lab DAC, because it, it will house a lot of the carbon mapper data when it's available for the public. So we'll make sure to get that website to you. Oh, here's. Here's a good question. How many, we're going to, there's a question about supervised classification. How many training samples do you typically use for supervised classification and why? Um, so that question is a little hard to answer because the way we like to answer it is as many as possible. It, the more training samples that you can do for supervised classification, the better off you are. Um, and so, and because one is you want to be able to get enough uh, spectral variation within a particular class that you're interested in. And so you want to pick training areas that are located throughout your study area um, and, and cover, so not just one area, but actually cover your entire study area. So that's really the most important, that you're trying to get all the spectral variability covered with your training areas. So that's not a very specific answer, but uh, you try to get as many as you can. So somebody asked about the legend in the Carbon Mapper website. Uh, so on the right-hand side, um, when you click on the little triangle next to the, to the uh, data set, more information come, slides down, includes a, a legend for the data that you see on the viewer. So there's a question here about some, re some researchers are using annual stacks of cloud-free Landsat image images as pseudo-hyperspectral images. Um, so if you're only using Landsat imagery, it's probably not hyperspectral. Um, it's certainly hypertemporal uh, images, so I'm not quite sure what that means there. Um, then they classify 
that image, um, the process is repeated annually. Do you think this approach is better than using one Landsat only? Um, my feeling is the more, if you use multiple Landsat images, that can only help you um, because you're capturing temporal changes in the vegetation if there, if there are any. Um, so sometimes using Landsat imagery from different times of the year will actually help you with your classification. It's a, it's a more work, but it will help you as opposed to one Landsat image only. Oh, good, you agreed, multi-temporal, not hyperspectral. <laughs> and just a reminder, there is homework this week. Amber just posted the link again. So for those of you interested in getting the certificate, please make sure you do the homework. Um, and I don't remember the due date. I think it's June 30th. There was no homework for week one. This is our first homework. Is it possible, here's a question, is it possible to classify a single tree in high resolution image using object based analysis and what are the prerequisites? Um, so classifying a single tree is dependent on the spatial resolution of your imagery. So um, if you have, if you consider high resolution as, you know, five meters or something, you're probably not going to get a single tree. So the spatial resolution of your imagery will determine whether you can classify single tree. It would have to be very, very high spatial resolution, um, but you could do it um, using object-based analysis. There's a question, is only Landsat images useful for carbon monitoring? Well, I was hoping that um, through our session today that we made it clear that Landsat is probably most prevalent for carbon monitoring. Um, we haven't talked much about the Sentinel satellites at all, um, the European satellites, but they are also um, useful for carbon monitoring. Um, the reason Landsat is, is because of its long history. Um, we have a, a great archive of Landsat imagery. It's spatial resolution, so you can map large areas, um, and it's temporal resolution. You can get it twice a month, um, every month, all year, except for the cloud problem. Um, but if the, uh, there are many other images out there, um, especially moderate resolution imagery, including Sentinel and others, that are becoming more and more prevalent, and any of those would probably be just as useful as Landsat. So there's a question about the advantage of spectral angle mapping technique over the maximum likelihood techniques uh, with respect to classification. So we didn't get into the details of the algorithms for classification, um, and and it's not, uh, we don't have actually the time to discuss it here. Um, that So if, I think we'll take that offline um, and get the answer uh, answer for you offline. I think maybe what we can do is is post that question and the answer in a separate document that we'll put on the uh, on the website. So there's a question regarding the tools you use for processing, such as classification, what are your favorites? And Brian, do you mean, is your question regarding the software or is it regarding the processing techniques? So if you could clarify, that would be great. Everyone has their own preference, by the way. <laughs> so I know there's several people who participated in the webinar today who have quite a bit of image processing um, experience. And so everyone will have their own opinion as to which software package as well as which processing technique works best for them. Software itself, okay. So the question is, what software? Um, 
I'm going to speak for our organization here. We have um, some commercial software called Envy, um, which is very powerful. Uh, and so Envy is one package you can use. We are starting to do some more advanced webinar series using an open source software called QGIS. Um, and QGIS is also becoming very powerful, uh, one, because it's open source. Uh, and two, a lot of people are contributing to writing modules that will do a lot of what we're discussing um, today. Um, and for example, we gave an advanced webinar series earlier in the year on how to use QGIS to do uh, NDVI, that kind of thing. Um, so that's becoming a really uh, nice, powerful package. So here's a good question. What is the best approach to classify forests if you do not have field survey data? Um, so the example would be separate degraded forest from reforestation from natural forest. So with remote sensing data and remote sensing processes, you really need to have some kind of ground verification data. Uh, field survey data is definitely uh, the best choice you can have. In absence of that, you could potentially use high resolution either satellite data, so something like um, data from Google Earth or something like that, or aerial photographs if you happen to have those. So something that's fairly high resolution um, and then interpreter that really knows that area. Uh, it's really hard to do work with Landsat imagery if you don't have that ground information. And I can't stress that enough. So there's a question about can you do object-oriented classification with QGIS as well. You know, I believe that you can. So Boston University has developed some uh, really great modules for, for QGIS um, that some of them will be demonstrated uh, in week four, I believe, but it's more geared towards accuracy assessment. Uh, it's called uh, BEODA, B-E-E-O-D-A, and we will post that website to you, but I do believe they have developed an object-oriented classification using QGIS. Oh, great. Thanks. Amber just posted the Biota website. So Google Earth Engine, um, there's a question about Google Earth Engine. And what I've been hearing from people, so we haven't started using it much here, but what I've heard from people is that it is could be potentially a game changer in terms of some of the processing that you can do. There's actually um, a Google Earth Engine Summit going on right now here in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is where we're located. Um, and I'm sure a lot of these issues are being discussed there. So stay tuned on that, because I think we're going to be potentially focusing some future webinars on the use of Google Earth Engine.
So one question is, is it possible to predict the carbon map of the future 10 years uh, using different modeling techniques? So yeah, there are some ecosystem models out there. And that may be another really great potential topic uh, for the future for us for doing a webinar is focusing on ecosystem models where we're looking at changes in uh, biomass of uh, vegetation types um, into the future, where, the, where it's changing, et cetera. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of folks out there. There's some challenges in doing that and, and some challenges in offering it as a webinar series in particular. Um, so that's uh, something we sort of discussed. There's some great chatter going on uh, about people helping up out about looking for different software packages for doing object-oriented classification, et cetera. That's great. Thanks to everyone for, for pitching in. I think there's a question about radar data. Uh, which radar data is, is best associated with Landsat data for carbon mapping? What I'm hearing from the silver carbon folks, and I wish Jenny was on right now, is that they are starting to work more with the Sentinel um, satellite da radar data as maybe a little bit of radar. Okay, I think the questions are starting to die down now, so I think we'll go ahead and close off for today. I want to thank everyone for participating and listening to our webinar this week. And we look forward to having you um, participate next week, in the next three weeks. So again, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us. We'll try to answer the best we can. And again, I think what we'll do uh, for this particular webinar series is, is document a lot of the questions that are coming up and try to get answers to them and then post them in a document um, on our website. And if you have ideas for future trainings you'd like to see, um, please let us know that too. Thanks, everyone.